Well, a very good evening, everyone. As you start to join the webinar tonight, I can see you all coming in, which is marvellous news. Uh, people have been booked on to do this from all over the world, and uh, and that's absolutely fabulous. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing Steve Rothwell tonight on um, the subject of the Burma Rifles and the Burma Army. It's a remarkable subject and uh, remarkably uh, poorly understood and, and unknown, certainly in this country. And Steve, over the last 15 years or so, has been ploughing at his own steady furrow in uncovering some of the mysteries of the um, this period of time before the war. Um, so we've got about 120 people, I think, registered tonight. We're about halfway there. I can see the numbers piling in, which is really good. Good to see some old friends joining us tonight as well. And if you've got any questions, stick them in the question and answer box or you can stick them in the chat box. I'm going to be relaxing tonight and allowing Steve to do most of the donkey work. And uh, but I'll be following the Q&A and I'll answer questions um, as we go through. Thanks very much. Nice to see David and um, Ian. Marvellous. And and John as well. John's a very old Burma hand. Nice to see you on tonight, John. And um, we've got people again from right across the globe, which is exciting. And uh, we know that quite a number of people will be dialing in um, on YouTube or however it's done after this to enjoy it. Right. Well, that's enough for me. Welcome, everyone. I'll hand over to our Chief Executive, Sylvia May. Thank you, Rob. And hello again, everyone. And a very warm welcome to you. I'm delighted to say that this is our 20th webinar and that we have been putting them on for three years now. And it was is with thanks to you, our viewers, and to all of the guest speakers that has made this possible and created such a successful programme. Just to remind you, they are all available on our website to view at any time. And I must say, they make an impressive historical collections library. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Steve Rothwell, who will be taking us through the role of the Burma Rifles in the campaign. Perhaps known only to a few, there was a Burma army quite separate from that of the British and Indian armies, but which fought alongside both. Soldiers of the Burma army contributed their unique knowledge of the land, its peoples and its languages, and gave great assistance to all allied troops. They fought on the Indian frontier. They were present at Kohima. They operated behind Japanese lines with the Chindits. They took part in the Chinese-American struggle for Maichna, and they supported every Anglo-Indian formation during the reconquest of Burma. Steve's interest began as it often does with a family connection. His uncle served as an infantryman in India and Burma, and like most of the soldiers in this campaign, never spoke about his experiences. Steve set out to find more information and found little available. He also discovered huge gaps in the archives, as much material had been destroyed during the retreat. So he set out to reconstruct and research the history of the Burma Rifles, and we are delighted to welcome you, Steve, this evening. Please feel free to ask questions on either the chat or Q&A, as Rob has already said, and we will try and answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Hosting us this evening, as always, is Dr. Robert Lyman brilliant military historian and author, to whom I will now hand over to start the evening's presentation. Over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That always makes me very nervous to hear words like that, but it is really exciting to be involved with these webinars. And uh, and as Sylvia says, it's the fabulous historic record of, uh, of the war. I've been trying to get Steve on this programme for a very long time, and we're absolutely delighted that he's going to be taking us through the subject tonight. Steve has been um, has got a fabulous website, which he will talk to you a little bit about at the end. Uh, and I do recommend, please go and have a good look at it. Uh, it's certainly been my go to uh, source for a very long time in my books when I wanted uh, detailed information um, about uh, the Burma rifles of the Burma army. Then Steve always found something for me. And um, we collaborated together on a wonderful um TV program, I think it was Channel 4, I can't recall, Channel 4 or 5 in 2015 called 
uh, calling Blighty. Uh, and it's available it's, every now and again. It's shown again on TV, but it's certainly available um, on YouTube. And I would encourage you to go and watch that really exciting and moving um, piece of uh, document, document, documentary work. And that's where Steve and I really engaged um, about eight years ago. Anyway, that's enough waffle from me, Steve. You, you're very welcome tonight. We're looking forward very much to hearing your presentation and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Rob. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, let's just get the screen sharing up. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes, perfect. Um, yes, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, Sylvia's given a great introduction um, to the talk. Um, I've titled it Burma Rifles really to just get people's attention. Um, it's really about um, the wider scope of, of what was the Burma Army, uh, which I've called the Unknown Army. Uh, and as Sylvia said, many people will have heard of the Burma Rifles. Um, but there are some questions in terms of who were these men? Were they the only Burmese soldiers who fought against the Japanese? And indeed, were all of these soldiers Burmese? Um, as we've heard, there was a Burma army, quite separate from the British and Indian armies, but which fought alongside them. In this presentation, I'll introduce you to the Burma army and the role it played in the struggle for Burma. So, first of all, a bit of background. Um, until 1937, Burma was administered as a part of India. Its defence was the responsibility of the, Indian, of the government of India and of the Indian Army. In April 1937, Burma was separated from India and became responsible uh, for its own defence and its own defence forces. And it's at this point that the Burma Army came into existence. No, there's something not working here. Hang on a second. Let's try again. Right. Can you see that screen? It says the Burma Army and not 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 yet. Um, if you no. share it again, well, let's um, try again. Sorry about this. We doesn't matter. If it doesn't work, then I'll share my screen. There we are. Perfect. There we are. Right. So the Burma Army came into existence from April 1937. Um, and we can see here um, the images from the first army list, uh, the Burma Army list, uh, taking on a similar format to the British Army list and the India, Indian Army list, for those of you who are familiar with those. And the, fir the first issue of this came out in January 1938 listing all elements of the Burma army and all uh, units of the British and Indian armies uh, serving in Burma at that time. The main units of the Burma army were the Burma Rifles Regiment, the Burma Military Police, the Burma Frontier Force and the Burma Auxiliary Force. These all played a big part in the 1942 campaign. However, following that defeat and the withdrawal to India um, round about May, June 1942, um, later on, the survivors of the Burma army were reorganized and new units emerged. Uh, the main elements of these being the Burma Regiment, the Burma Intelligence Corps and the levies. But who were the men who manned these units? Who were these soldiers? Well, from 1937, the Burma army drew its recruits from the peoples of Burma. Um, and to give you an idea, the, the available population figures are from 1941, where there was a total population in Burma of around 17 million people. Of the Burmese population, about 10 million were Burmans. Uh, these are the people who inhabit um, the plains and the river delta uh, around Rangoon of Burma. 
Um, six million were what we will refer to as the hill tribes. Um, the Karen, the Kachin, the Chins, the Shans, and the Nagas who straddle the Indo-Burmese border um, up in the northeast, uh, the northwest rather. In addition to these uh, people, uh, there were one million Indians and Gurkhas. Um, these had originally been migrant workers and their descendants continued to live in Burma. And as you can see, quite a significant population of around a million people. There was a small population of British, Anglo-Burmans and Anglo-Indians. Now, this ethnic breakdown becomes important when you consider that the Burmans, the majority population, were opposed to British rule and to participating in imperial defence. Few served in the Burma Defence Forces. Instead, the Burma army drew on the hill tribes, the Indian and Gurkha communities and the Anglo-Burmans and Anglo-Indians. These groups were more loyal and dependable in times of civil strife. British officers were seconded from the Indian Army and later reinforced by British citizens of Burma who were commissioned into the army after host hostilities had begun. Now we'll deal with the Burma Rifles first. This was the major infantry unit transferred from India to Burma. So the 1922 reorganisation of the Indian infantry resulted in the creation of 20 infantry regiments, each of several battalions. And the 20th regiment was the Burma Rifles, known as the 20th Burma Rifles. At separation in 1937, this regiment transferred to Burma, losing the number 20 from its title, as it was no longer a regiment of the Indian Army becoming simply the Burma Rifles. Now, at that time, there were four regular rifle or infantry battalions and one territorial battalion. Finding photographs of the Burma Rifles is extremely difficult. They are very rare indeed. And certainly uh, I've discovered very few photographs um, from the wartime period. As you might be able to see here, a photograph, uh, a very smartly turned out group of men. They're actually a machine gun team belonging to one of the battalions of the 20th Burma Rifles. So this would be when the regiment was still part of the Indian Army, sometime between 1922 and 1937. Then from 1939, after the Second World War had started, Burma undertook an expansion of its armed forces. The Burma Rifles added four infantry battalions, a holding battalion, or the, the reserve battalion, as you can see in this list, a training battalion, and three territorial battalions, um, two of which were formed from um, the Shan peoples. The 5th and 6th battalions were created by milking the existing battalions, the 1st to 4th battalions, um, and for the first time, Burman recruits were taken in to the regiment. The photograph here um, shows you um, members, uh, new recruits to the Burma Rifles. Um, fairly obviously, they're undertaking physical training. So this dates from the period sometime between 1940, 1941. Um, Interestingly, the 7th and 8th battalions were formed from existing um, corps or forces present in Burma. The 7th battalion was formed from men of the Burma Civil Police and the 8th battalion from men of the Burma Frontier Force. Now, the composition of the 1st to the 6th battalions was primarily um, Burmese, um, Kachins, uh, Karen and Chins, and as I've mentioned um, later on, uh, a, percent a percentage of uh, Burman peoples. But the 7th and 8th battalions um, were made up of mainly Indian and Gurkha soldiers. Um, so these were, as I've said, the 7th battalion, uh, there's a group photograph here, 
which gives uh, very clearly shows the ethnic makeup of the battalion. These are, I think, all Indian uh, or Gurkha soldiers. In this instance, uh, they were former policemen for the most part. All the battalions of the Burma Rifles took part in the 1942 campaign with dif differing um, success. The 6th Battalion was effectively destroyed in the early fighting around Tavoy in, in February 1942. The 3rd Battalion um, also took part um, in the fighting around Tavoy and, and lost two companies there. The rest of the bat battalion was badly handled at the fighting for more main. Um, Later on, the 3rd and 4th Battalions were disbanded, um, it being viewed by the army that they performed poorly. But the remaining battalions soldiered on and gave good service. And a large number of these riflemen reached India, along with the British and Indian troops, um, in May and June 1942. Now we come on to perhaps the most famous battalion of the Burma Rifles, known simply as the 2nd Burma Rifles, the 2nd Battalion of the Burma Rifles Regiment. Upon reaching India, the 2nd Battalion, uh, uh, which arrived in relatively good order, um, was almost immediately reorganised as a special reconnaissance unit. The soldiers of the battalion were almost entirely Karen, Kachins and Chins, Burmese. The battalion was given a special role and was assigned to special force, the Chindits. It served with great uh, distinction uh, on both Chindit operations, but not as a regular infantry battalion. Instead, it was organised as uh, a series of platoons, six platoons, I think, each of which were assigned individually to Chindit columns. Uh, Wingate was very impressed with uh, the performance of the 2nd Burma Rifles on the 1943 expedition. Um, the 2nd Burma Rifles also took part in the 1944 um, Chindit expedition. Here's a group photograph of the battalion. Um, I think this was this was taken in India. Um, unfortunately, there's no detail to say whether this was before or after the Chinde operation of that year. By 1945, there was no longer any need for special force or the Chindits, and the 2nd Burma Rifles was reorganised once again, returning to the role of a regular rifle battalion. Uh, it saw no further action um, in the war against the Japanese. Uh, so that was a, a brief run through the Burma Rifles. But now we come on to perhaps um, the really unknown elements of the Burma army. And we'll start with the Burma Military Police. The Burma Military Police was created in the 1850s to maintain internal security within Burma. And prior to separation in 1937, there were nine battalions, mainly Indian and Gurkha, but with a significant number of Karens. Um, the photograph here, again, very, it's proved impossible to find photographs so far of Burma military policemen, 1941-1942. Um, this photograph dates from the 1930s. Uh, and as you can see, this gentleman is a, is, is a Sikh soldier. So at separation, three battalions of the Burma military police um, were retained. They operated under civil administration under the Burma Home Office, and in peacetime, the role of the Burma Military Police was to support the Burma Civil Police. There were three battalions, as I've said. There were two large battalions based in Rangoon, and there was a third battalion in Ma Mandalay. Um, and effect effectively, in peacetime, they were armed civil police. And as I've said, their role was to support civil police in times of internal unrest. The Burma Military Police played an important role in the 1942 campaign, 
um, undertaking roles such as uh, lines of communication, troops, um, guards, and very importantly, they acted um, as intelligence gatherers and translators um, between the army and the local Burmese population. Uh, and this is a theme that we'll pick up later in the presentation. Created, also created at se separation was the Burma Frontier Force, which was formed from the other six battalions of the Burma Military Police. Now, the Burma Frontier Force was manned by Indians, Gurkhas, and a large number of Chins. It, again, like the Burma Military Police, it was an armed civil force that came under the Defence Department and was charged largely with the internal security of the frontier areas. Um, at this time in Burma, the frontier areas where the peoples are, I've loosely described as the hill tribes, um, it was administered very differently from, from the main part of Burma. And the role of the Burma Frontier Force was to um, police these areas, um, to be there in times of uh, trouble, internal strife, and also to keep an eye on the borders themselves, particularly uh, the border areas um, with China and with Siam, today Thailand. So there were six battalions, you can see them listed here, and together with the locations of the battalion headquarters. Uh, a seventh battalion was formed in 1940, uh, the Coquine Battalion, mm -hmm. And this was largely done uh, in order to provide guards for airfields, bridges and other vital points. The photograph here, again, a rare photograph, Burma Frontier Force. Uh, as we'll see on the next slide, when it came to the war itself fighting the Japanese, the Burma Frontier Force didn't fight as infantry battalions, but was organised into a, um, a number of columns. Um, this photograph is of number four bicycle infantry column, which formed part of a, mo of a Burma Frontier Force mobile detachment known as FF4. Uh, those of you with sharp eyes can perhaps see on the balcony behind these men uh, that the photograph was taken in August 1944. Um, again, it's interesting to note that virtually all the men in the photograph are Sikhs. So as I've just said, when it, when the war started, um, the Burma Frontier Force was organised into a number of detachments or columns. Um, these these were given um, these were known as Frontier Force, followed by a number such as Frontier Force One, FF Two, FF Three, and so on. And eventually, during that uh, the 1942 campaign. Um, there were as many as nine FF detachments in operation. They were light uh, mobile detachments. Um, I'll put mobile in inverted commas. Um, some of the columns making up the detachments had been mobile, uh, made mobile by the limited deployment of some motor transport. But I think a lot of this was actually um, taken over by the army. Um, some of the detachments that we've seen uh, were mobile using bicycles, um, but a lot of the men um, got around on foot. But they were lightly equipped and they were able to move quite quickly. There were also a number of mounted infantry detachments attached to some of the columns, and these men were mounted on ponies for greater mobility. Now, the army valued the FF columns and deployed them in screening the main force and in wide ranging reconnaissance patrols, trying to keep tabs on the advancing Japanese. A very difficult task, um, not always successful, and the lack of intelligence was probably one of the main contributing factors to the British defeat in Burma in 1942. Um, these two images I've taken from uh, a rare 1942 newsreel and they show a Burma Frontier Force detachment on patrol. Um, they're led by a British officer, uh, Captain Edwards, who sadly was subsequently killed near Prome in April 1942. 
Now, the Burma Frontier Force Mounted Infantry, as I've said, they were uh, highly valued for their mobility. And the army um, complained, really, that there was never enough of them to meet their needs. Uh, there's also um, an incident which is noted by some writers um, as, as the last British cavalry charge, where a mounted infantry detachment belonging to FF3 of the Burma Frontier Force um, conducted a charge against Japanese troops, I think uh, on the airfield at Tungu, and this, this occurred on 19th of March 1942. Uh, whether this was indeed a cavalry charge or the last British cavalry charge is probably something that we could all, all debate and point to other examples. But it's important to remember that these detachments were not real cavalry. They were infantry soldiers who used ponies to enhance their mobility. So I think the final um, element of the Burma army, the pre-war Burma Army that I want to introduce you to now is the Burma Auxiliary Force. Formerly units of the Indian Auxiliary Force, those residing in Burma in 1937 were transferred to Burma at separation. The Burma Auxiliary Force was a part-time militia, in some ways similar to our territorial army. Its officers were British residents of Burma, who along with Anglo-Burmans and Anglo-Indians, also made up the rank and file. Um, the Burma Auxiliary Force was made up um, of several infantry battalions and a number of artillery units, and also included a small armoured car detachment. The four infantry battalions, which you can see listed here, um, were organised um, into companies the companies, uh, the number of companies in each battalion varied, um, and these battalions were tied to specific locations. Interestingly, it was a condition of employment of some of the major companies in Burma at that time that its employees became members of the Burma Auxiliary Force. The most notable of these was uh, Burma Railways employees. Um, who it was a condition of their employment that they were all members of the Burma Railways Battalion. Um, this, this in particular was to have, play a vital role in the 1942 campaign as the men of the Burma Railways Battalion were important in keeping the railways running, uh, which was one of the few forms of mobility available to the British and Indian troops. And during the retreat to India in 1942, the BAF played an important role in keeping these major transportation systems working. I've mentioned the Burma Railways, but some of the Burma Auxiliary Force men also ended up manning river craft of the Irrawaddy River Flotilla Company. Others also undertook major demolitions, notably helping to blow the oil fields at Yanangyong. One of the main artillery components before the war of the Bur belonging to the Burma Auxiliary Force, the BAF, was the Rangoon Field Brigade. Right at the top of the screen, you hopefully you can make out uh, an image there. That's actually um, the horse-drawn limbers um, of some eight World War I vintage 18-pounder field guns. Uh, this photograph was taken, I believe, at one of the annual camps where the brigade turned out in full um, to rehearse its role. In 1940, the Rangoon Field Brigade was reorganised, um, out of which came the 5th Field Battery. And um, it was uh, the Burma government was able to acquire some light motor vehicles to replace the horses that drew the guns. But as you can see in the, these, the lower image here, is very much an 18 pounder of, 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 of World War I vintage and including the limber which carried the ammunition. These two images are again taken from a war, wartime newsreel and I believe they show members of the 5th Field Battery in action at Martaban um, on the Salween River after the fall of Malmain in January 1942. 
Burma Auxiliary Force also forms anti-aircraft artillery, uh, forming the first heavy, heavy anti-aircraft regiment, which consisted of a heavy battery and a light battery. Uh, these, these units were in action against Japanese aircraft over Rangoon and later covered the army during the retreat. The top photo is a pre-war photograph and shows men of the 1st Heavy Anti-Aircraft Regiment in Rangoon. Uh, it was taken in 1941. The lower photograph is of uh, surviving men of the 3rd Light Anti-Aircraft Battery. Uh, it was taken at Mao in India in May 1942, shortly before the battery was disbanded. Um, as to the disbandment, we'll, we'll come on to that shortly. I also mentioned that there was a detachment of armoured cars. Um, there was an armoured car, armored car section which was attached to the Rangoon Infantry Battalion. Um, there were four Rolls-Royce Indian pattern armoured cars, each with a single Vickers 303 machine gun. Um, this photograph here I was fortunate, fortunate, fortunate enough uh, to obtain from David Fletcher, who some of you may know was the curator of the Tank Museum for a very long time. Um, interestingly, um, these armoured cars weren't bulletproof um, and um, they, they struggled to really have an effect um, in the early fighting. Um, they featured in the early fighting in southern Burma against the Japanese and all were lost um, in that fighting uh, that led up to the Sitang Bridge disaster in February 1942. So what we've done there is really co is covered the uh, main units of the Burma army um, that, that were formed pre-war and that participated in the 1942 campaign. Several thousand of these men withdrew to India along with the British and Indian troops that they'd fought alongside. The Burma government went into exile at Shimla and decided to reorganise the survivors and to make the units available for service with the Indian Army. Most of the men, apart from the second Burma rifles, who as we've seen uh, were sent off on a special role with the Chindits, most of the men were gathered at Hoshiarpur. The Burma Auxiliary Force went to Mahal. So as part of this reorganisation, a new regiment emerged. This was the Burma Regiment. Uh, it was formed uh, at Hoshiarpur in October 1942. It consisted of six infantry battalions, a 7th Mounted Infantry Battalion uh, and two garrison battalions. The sole surviving unit of the Burma Frontier Force, the Chin, Hill, Chin Hills Battalion, transferred to the new regiment. One company from each of the infantry battalions was sent to the Indian frontier and into Burma on independent missions. This late in 1942, early 1943. Some of the companies were involved in escorting the civil administrators who were still active in the frontier area. Two of the companies were sent to Fort Hertz in North Burma, where they supported the Kachin levies fighting against the Japanese based around Michinar. And one, as we shall see, found itself at Kohima in April 1944. There were never enough soldiers for the Burma Regiment, and the 3rd, 5th and 6th Battalions and the Mounted Infantry Battalion were later disbanded to provide reinforcements for the remaining units. Those remaining units did, however, see action against the Japanese. The 4th Battalion, uh, mainly Gurkhas, was sent to Fort Hertz to reinforce the two companies sent there previously, along with the Kachin levies. These units gave invaluable support to the Chinese-American drive on Michinar as part of the American plan to construct the Lido Road um, to reinforce send reinforcements and supplies to China. Um, on the map, you can see the area I've circled. So the men of the Burma Regiment and the Kachin levies uh, fought on what was the left flank of the Chinese-American force driving down to Michinar. Uh, 
there are stories that the Americans never really understood who the Burma Regiment actually was. As you, this this map is taken from an American history, where the the Burma Regiment are referred to as Gurkha Levies. Um, the campaign to capture Michinar was successful. It was an arduous campaign, and after which the fourth battalion was withdrawn to India. Uh, but it later returned to Burma in 1945 and took part in internal security operations. The second battalion, again formed mainly of Gurkhas, went to Burma in 1945, participating in internal security operations against Japanese stragglers and dacoits, uh, the local Burmese bandits. And the Burma regiment was also present at Kohima, uh, which is perhaps a great relevance to the, to this group here tonight. The Indian official history lists the order of battle of the Kohima garrison as at 4th of April 1944. And you can see I've highlighted the infantry component of this order of battle. And amongst the infantry were two detachments of the Burma Regiment. There was a company of the 1st Garrison Battalion and there was a company of the 5th of the 5th Battalion. The company of the Garrison Battalion was actually B Detachment and had been sent to Kohima in March 1944 for training in jungle warfare. But when the Japanese offensive materialised, it was at first attached to the 50th Indian Parachute Brigade and was sent to defend the FEC area. It was withdrawn to Kohima on the night of 31st of March, 1st of April, taking up positions on Jail Hill. But following heavy Japanese attack, it then withdrew to Garrison Hill, where it remained until the relief of the garrison and left Kohima on 20th of April. The deeds of the company of the 5th Battalion have proven impossible to pin down. I found no records for this unit. Um, it's, it's, it's a gap in my research. So while Kohima was besieged, um, outside of that area, the 1st Battalion arrived the 1st Battalion, mainly Sikhs and Punjabi Muslims, um, had actually been en route to Fort Hertz to reinforce the 4th Battalion and the other elements of the regiment and the Kachin levies in their fight against the Japanese. Um, the 1st Battalion arrived uh, and took up a blocking position on the Dimapur Kohima Road on 25th of March. It was attached to the 161st Indian Infantry Brigade and later came under the command of the 2nd British Infantry Division. It was involved in the fighting to clear the Japanese from the Kohima area, and later, as part of the 7th Indian Infantry Division, took part in the pursuit to Okral and later the crossing of the Irrawaddy. In April 1945, it formed part of the 5th Indian Infantry Division and took part in the final stages of the reconquest of Burma and in the reoccupation of Singapore. This busy, busy battalion, uh, its service continued after the war when it was sent to Sumatra in 1945 with the 26th Indian Infantry Division before finally returning to Burma in November 1946. Uh, if you recall, one of the lessons of the 1942 campaign had been the need to main, maintain contact with the local Burmese po population who could be a good source of information on intelligence of Japanese movements for the army. Ray, and, and this lesson was, was, was learned um, in practice by the formation of the Burma Intelligence Corps. Um, raised at Mahau, mainly from officers and men of the Burma Auxiliary Force, um, if you remember the, the surviving units of the BAF that arrived in India, they were disbanded upon arrival. Most of those men uh, went to the Burma Intelligence Corps. The Burma Intelligence Corps went on to support every major formation of the 14th Army with platoons attached to each corps and division. And men of the Burma Intelligence Corps accompanied the Chindits. Again, another rare photograph here um, shows men of the Burma Intelligence Corps while actually serving with the Chindits. Um, I'm not sure when, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say this was the second expedition. 
Um, it's important to remember here, um, the term intelligence in the title of this of this um, core is perhaps misleading for its purpose was not um, an intelligence role as, as we might understand it, but its purpose was to help the military establish good relations with the local Burmese and to act as translators and guides. Former Burma Auxiliary Force men um, who spoke both English and at least one Burmese language were invaluable for this purpose. And eventually there were as many as 16 platoons of the Burma Intelligence Corps serving with the 14th Army. Uh, now we come to the later stages of the war and the immediate post-war period. Uh, during 1944, the government of Burma began to consider the restoration of its administration in Burma. One of the objectives of the government was to build a new Burma army for internal security duties in the soon to be liberated country. One complication was the need to incorporate personnel of the Patriotic Burma Forces. Um, the Patriotic Burma Forces had been formerly known as the Burma National Army, uh, which had actually fought against the British before switching sides when Japanese defeat seemed certain. Led by Aung San, uh, father of Aung San Suu Kyi, who you've all probably heard of, uh, the PBF began to assert more influence on the structure of this new Burma army as it was being formed. Um, this became more relevant um, when, when it became clear that Burma was likely to become independent very soon after the war had, had ended. So this new Burma army, what did it consist of? Well, the Burma, the Burma rifles were reborn. In addition to the veteran second Burma rifles, five new Burma rifles battalions were formed. These, in, uh, these included many former uh, patriotic Burma forces personnel. The levies, um, of which there were three, um, the Karen levies, uh, the northern Kachin levies, who we uh, mentioned in passing, uh, and also the Chin levies, um, who were active in the Chin Hills. These were all reorganised and trained as regular rifle battalions. The Chin Hills battalion and the 2nd and 4th battalions, mainly Gurkhas, of the Burma regiment were retained, uh, the latter at the request of Aung San, who valued, uh, who considered them to be uh, valuable additions to what would become um, the new Burma army following independence. Um, the 1st Battalion was not retained and I think was disbanded before independence. Um, if you remember, um, it, its manpower was, was Indian. Um, those of you who might be interested in following what happened to the Burma Army after independence in 1948, all of these units played active and often opposing roles in the civil wars which followed. Um, the patriotic Burma forces were not um, a politically coherent, uh, cohesive um, organisation. And um, in, in the immediate years after independence, there were a number of uh, rebellions. Um, there was fighting against uh, the Karens. Um, there was fighting against various socialist and communist factions. Um, quite a complicated story. Uh, more of which you could find on my website. Um, well, that's been quite a cavalry charge um, through the history of um, the Burma army from formation in 1937 until the independence at the end of 1947, actually January 1948. Uh, we've seen the evolution of this diverse organisation and the important role it played in supporting British and Indian troops in the struggle in Burma. There's much, much more detail that um, obviously time here doesn't permit the inclusion of. Um, if you are interested in finding out more, um, please visit my website. It's called the Burma Campaign, um, but you can find it at the address at the bottom of the screen here, indiaburmasoldiers.co.uk. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'll now hand back to Rob.
Thank you very much indeed, Steve. That's fabulous. And uh, we're going to invite you back to so you can take us through uh, various parts of the campaign uh, as it um, developed from 1942 to 1945 and, and tell us a little bit a little bit more detail. But we'll uh, we'll plug you in sometime next year. A couple of uh, interesting questions. One uh, from George Wilton, who's currently writing a book on 23 Brigade, which was about um, did the he, he's asking, well, I'll read it out. 23 Brigade had Burma riflemen attached during their training in India in 1944. I don't believe they went to the Naga Hills in April 44 and replaced by a Sam Rifles, but he's never seen anything definite. I've put you guys in touch with, with each other so you can have that conversation um, right. privately. But I would imagine that, <clears throat> excuse me, it makes complete sense that um, the Burma Regiment troops, or a number of them, were were heavily used for... Um, for training purposes through 43 and 44. The other question comes from um, John Hinchcliffe down in Padstow, who spent many years in, in uh, Burma, Myanmar. Does the name Lutin Brain, Lutin hyphen Brain, ring a bell with you in the Burma Intelligence Corps? Uh, not immediately. Um, it's some, I'll, I've got some lists of officers and men that I've come across that I've compiled over the years, so I'll have a look at that after this after we've finished here tonight, if John would like to get in touch with me. That's absolutely fabulous. I can send you John's email address. He's a good Thank friend. Um, just a question for me. It struck me that you know, you've struggled over the last 15 years to find sources. You've got personal memoirs. You've spoken to members of families and so on. But is there much of anything in the archives, either in Delhi or in uh, Kew, where, in fact, I've been today, um, about the... Um, various units in the Burma army before the war? Um, it varies. Um, as far as pre-war material is concerned, um, there's a fair amount that, that is available. Um, this really being documents that were sent from Burma to the UK for official purposes. Um, those have survived. Um, I think, as Sylvia may have mentioned in the introduction, one of the problems we've got um, as a result of the 1942 campaign is so many documents were lost, destroyed, um, or those that survived um, may have been maintained by the Burma government in exile, um, but then disappeared after uh, independence. Um, I forget the name of the gentleman. Was it um, was it Fukar who yeah, Fuka, dra Fuka. drafted yeah. the um, yeah. the official history of the 1942 yeah. campaign? We should be very grateful to him because um, he wrote to as many officers as he could get in touch with almost immediately after the Burma Army, uh, well, the Anglo-Burman uh, Indian yeah. Army re reached India, um, asking for details of the campaign. Um, where war diaries had not survived, uh, he was able to get officers to reconstruct from memory um, the missing war diaries, and those are in queue. They vary in, in detail, in length. They vary, in fact, some of them vary in quality, very difficult to read. Um, you know, they're, they're actually very early photocopies of a process I'm not familiar with. Yes. So, yes, um, the short answer is it's very difficult, very patchy. Uh, a lot of the documents were destroyed. As you've mentioned, some of the units, um, such as, for instance, the 9th Battalion Burma Rifles and I think the Mandalay Battalion of the Burma Military Police. I'm very grateful to family members of officers who served with the, those units for passing on um, accounts of their deeds. That's that's a very good point, actually. Um... <clears throat> we um, uh, there are some absolutely fabulous accounts of 1942. One um, by James Lunt, of course, many of um, our listeners will know, uh, called yeah. "Help Licking," really quite extraordinary story, um, and, um, and and lots of really detailed information about Burma rifles actions uh, then. Uh, there's another question uh, about them being online. The Burma, the army lists, both the Indian army lists. Well, the Indian Army lists are quite hard to find, a bit patchy. They You can usually find them on archive.org, but I've just done a quick search for the Burma Army list, and I 
haven't found them on archive.org. Do you know where they are, Steve? Are they available um, online? Um, as far as I'm aware, they're not available online. I found uh, most of them at the National Army Museum, and I believe that some of them are also available at the National Archives. Okay. Okay. So, well, if, if um, for that for that person, as Andrew Kilsby, just do a search of Discovery, which is the National Archives. Yeah. Um, database, which is absolutely fabulous, a very, very impressive database. It's getting better all the time. And see if it's there. It's uh, I don't know where you are, Andrew, but let me know if you've got problems. I I'm there quite regularly. Um, um, if that if that gentleman's looking for a, a particular person, then perhaps again, if you put us in touch, Rob, um, I I do I do have um, photographed copies of most okay. of the. Burma Army list. Okay, well, Andrew, Andrew's in Melbourne, but um, uh, Andrew, I, you know, send me an email and I'll put you in touch with Steve. That's absolutely fabulous. Right, well, thank you very much, uh, Steve. I think what you've done is you've whetted our appetite for a little bit more of um, this uh, this dimension to the fighting through the campaign, which you know, a number of us have become recently more au fait uh, with in terms of the action in 1945, uh, Richard Duckett, who's listening tonight, has written an absolutely outstanding book on Force 136 and has yes, got everyone's attention. The role of uh, the Karen levies, as they were called, uh, as part of SOE. But of course, we mustn't forget the work of um, all those parts of the Burma Army during 1942 and then subsequently through 43. And as you've discussed tonight with George Wilton, through the training effort uh, undertaken to prepare the Indian Army and indeed the British Army for operations in uh, Assam, Manipur and Burma in 44-45. Well, we'll draw stumps there and I'm going to hand over to Sylvia May um, as we wrap up tonight. Sylvia. Thanks, Rob. And thank you, Steve. Again, may I add my thanks for a fascinating talk and unearthing these tremendous photographs that you were showing and background. It was really interesting. Um, so with thanks to a, a dear friend, Antre Nu, a wing commander in the RAF, if Steve can show the next slide, we are able to bring you for this Christmas 3D printed Christmas tree decorations, believe it or not. They are amazing. The brand new one is an M3 Grant tank. And then we have a Dakota who's in silver this year. He was in gold last year and, uh, and a hurricane designed in Jimmy Whalen's memory. So they're collector's items for sure, and they're selling really fast. They can all be purchased on our online store, where you will also find lots of Naga jewellery, bags and shawls available, which will all make lovely, lovely Christmas gifts. Still just time to order. I'm pretty quick on getting the orders out. There are also a few Christmas cards left for those of you that still need some um ours are all been made handmade in naga homes they're quite special and of course we've got many of rob lyman's books that are available to purchase as well and then next year um this is our 80th anniversary poppy pin and as you all know next year is the 80th anniversary of the battle uh ket has been invited by the national army museum to hold a weekend uh events of talks across two days the 20th and 21st of april when Rob will be in discussion with Mark Slim, amongst many other talks being arranged. The full program is on our website. And we're also holding the annual, our annual commemoration service in York on Thursday, the 4th of July, where we'll also be hosting a gala dinner on the night before when the guest speaker will be Lord Dannett. I'll send out the booking information for the York event in the new year. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, January the 18th, when Charlotte Carty will be taking us through the involvement of the Old Sherbonians in the Burma campaign. And we will be joined that evening by members of the Old Sherbonian Association, hopefully. So thank you for all for joining us this evening. May I wish you all a very happy Christmas and we look forward very much to seeing you in 2024. Good night.